Pascal, so good to see you again, and thanks for joining us. A really good quarter for you guys, and really playing out the sort of focus of the company on core areas and getting the profits to follow that. What can you tell us about how this is playing out and what that means for the outlook for 2024? Yeah, thanks, Anjali. It's great to see you again. Uh, we had a tremendous first quarter. Uh, overall, our revenue grew by 19%. Um, but what the most exciting uh, part of it is every uh, portfolio of products grew. Uh, oncology, 26%. Cardiovascular grew. Respiratory immunology grew. Rare disease grew by 16%. Uh, every geography grew 19% in the US and Europe. The most remarkable was the growth in the emerging market outside of China. 40% growth. It really shows that we are bringing our medicines to lots and lots of patients around the world. Um, and uh, our company is really doing very, very well uh, across the geographies and across the portfolio. Absolutely. ADCs in particular are helping to drive a profit for the quarter. So that's a really good buzzy area to be in. I'm glad you mentioned China because I know that there's a lot going on. Broader picture, if we look at U.S.-China ties, we of course know uh, the Biosecure Act is in Congress right now. And you have had ties with China. I know you have operations independent as well as partnerships, as well as a target $1 billion fund. What can you tell us about how, if this act passes and is signed into law, what kind of pressure that can put on the company? Well, I mean, China is certainly a very important uh, country from the point of view of having to serve 1.4 billion people, but also more importantly, recently, from the point of view of the innovation that is happening in China, especially new technologies, cell therapy, T-cell engagers, and many others. Um, so we are very much uh, engaged in China, and we have been for many, many years. Having said that, of course, we have considered all these uh, geopolitical tensions, and we have established a very resilient supply chain. Uh, we have manufacturing sites in China for China and some other countries in the emerging markets in particular. And of course, we have a supply chain that is dedicated to what you might call the Western world, uh, the US and, uh, and uh, Europe, for instance, we are right now in the process of building a cell therapy manufacturing site in Maryland. So we really have a very resilient uh, supply chain that has shown that uh, it can sustain a crisis. Uh, and the COVID was a good example of this. Absolutely. Moving on to one of your drugs, Farsiga, I know that that has been, of course, a focus for the U.S. as well. Engaged in negotiations with Medicare, you've already said in the past that you're pretty good with where they're coming in from. What can you tell us about the response that you're getting for the initial back and forth, uh, you know, for the negotiations and how much of a delta currently exists between where you're looking to land and where the government is coming from? Well, that's a great question. The uh, First of all, I should say uh, Fasiga is a very important medicine for the treatment of diabetes, but also kidney disease, uh, heart disease. And it has really made a tremendous uh, difference to patients around the world. Uh, and also the class, the so-called SGLT2 class has made a huge difference. In the United States, uh, Fasiga will lose patent protection early 2026. So those uh, pricing discussions come on the back end of the life cycle of, uh, of Farsiga in the United States. I cannot really specifically comment on the discussions and negotiations that are ongoing, um, but suddenly we will make sure that uh, we retain the ability to serve patients, uh, leverage those uh, discussions to make sure that the product is more affordable and more patients can uh, benefit from this very important medicine. Speaking of affordability for patients, you are in the ADC space. I know there's a lot of energy around this uh, antibody uh, drug conjugates for cancer. And that seems to be an area also where it leads to the conversation about newer technologies and the expense that patients have to take on as a result. What can you tell us about how you're thinking about moving forward in this space and the different therapies that are coming to market and how it's going to affect the wallets of patients? Yeah, so actually, uh, for your viewers, a very quick explanation of what an antibody drug conjugate is. It's essentially combining an antibody with a toxin, and they are very different type of toxins. And the antibody will target the cancer cells and deliver the toxin to the cancer cell. Um, and it's re essentially uh, aiming at replacing traditional chemotherapy. And it's much more uh, targeted, of course, so you deliver high efficacy 
and uh, better tolerability. Another type of uh, such products is so-called radio conjugate, where you attach a um, um, radioisotope to an antibody, and essentially you can complement or replace radiotherapy and target much smaller tumors in the body that uh, radiotherapy could not traditionally uh, target or, or reach. So those are really transformative agents, and we intend to combine those with our uh, antibody, uh, our immuno-oncology immuno, uh, immuno products, especially our biospecifics, and we think we can transform the care of many, many uh, cancers. And of course, uh, the uh, cost of those uh, newer agents is is higher, and suddenly we are around the world looking at solutions to make sure that uh, patients actually can afford them. Uh, in the United States, Medicare covers those injectable products, so it's a little bit easier, but suddenly patients still have co-pays to, to cover. Absolutely. We'll have to leave it there for this quarter. Thank you so much, Pascal Sorio, AstraZeneca CEO. Thank you very much.